All right, so I am all that stands between you and lunch. So uh, thank you, Gamma, for the invitation and, uh, to speak. Um, I also changed the title of my presentation today uh, because even though you've heard uh, Guillermo's bias already, uh, I've changed the topic of my ta uh, the title of my talk from which cytoreductive therapy to uh, which, if any, cytoreductive therapy uh, do we use in uh, preparation for our patients with MDS. Sadly, I have no relevant disclosures. So, um, unlike my colleagues who have spoken uh, before me, I'm going to bring you into the data-free zone uh, in transplantation. Um, you heard that uh, Dr. Padron had one randomized phase three trial in uh, CMML. Uh, I've got none to show you today. And so all you get to hear is my interpretation of fairly limited phase two data. So the question before us is why do we want to cytoreduce prior to transplantation for MDS? We've all established that at some point transplantation is part of the treatment algorithm, but getting our patients to the transplant unit in the best possible fashion remains the issue at question. And so if one looks at older retrospective data, and this is a sample of about 85 patients uh, treated at one uh, big center in the Midwest, we see that individuals who come into transplant with lower blast counts have less relapse rates and better overall survival or relapse-free survival in this curve. The problem is, is that the data that we have does not take into consideration patients who underwent treatment for their MDS and then never made it to the transplant unit. And so this is a retrospective series of patients who were treated and who were transplanted. And so we are looking at this data from the wrong starting point. We all want to bring our patients in and give them the highest chance of survival after transplantation. And we know that the lower the disease risk, as reflected by blast count and cytogenetics, et cetera, the better the outcomes that we can anticipate. And so since nobody refers patients to me with very low risk MDS or low risk MDS, is there a way of bringing these patients into the transplant unit with higher risk disease that has been reverted to an earlier state? And that's really the question before us. So what are our options prior to transplantation? They are uh, listed here. We have induction chemotherapy. We have the hypomethylating agents, clinical trials, which we all should be um, pushing our patients towards. And then quite frankly, nothing, which I think is a very viable option in this disease for the right patient. So I'll go through the data or lack thereof for the different approaches starting with uh, what was the first publication comparing chemotherapy to no chemotherapy for patients uh, going through transplant. And this was a Japanese series published in 2005. It wasn't very big. Uh, there were 140 patients overall. However, some of these patients had what would now be considered acute myeloid leukemia, so RAB-T, and some of them had true uh, transformed AML arising out of MDS. So what, do we, what can we glean from, from a, a curve like this? Well, basically, if you did really well with chemotherapy, if you had favorable risk disease, then you were going to do no different than is if you were untested and went into transplant without chemotherapy at all. What it did show is that if you did poorly with chemotherapy, if your disease was resistant, this predicted a poor prognosis with transplantation itself. So this doesn't really predict who's going to do well, Giving chemotherapy in this setting simply predicts who's going to do poorly. And one could argue that the patients who did not respond at all to chemotherapy, and this is traditional induction type chemotherapy, perhaps these are patients who should be shunted away from the transplant unit immediately and shunted towards innovative clinical trials before coming back for consideration of transplantation. A second very similar type study was reported by the Fred Hutch group around the same time. The results are a little bit different, and so it's worth looking at both uh, sets of data 
independently. So this was a series of about 125 patients. These patients were transplanted at a single center over a decade. So this is a long experience, 1992 to 2002, during which time there were major changes in the way we approached transplantation. The sample sizes were small, and once again, this is a very biased approach. So only 33 of the 125 patients here went on to receive induction chemotherapy. 31 of the 33 went on to get transplant. Two were eliminated because of disease relapse prior to transplant, not TRM. And here, um, we really see no difference in comparison to the Japanese data. So no excess treatment-related mortality for patients who underwent chemotherapy, and really no benefit for those to who got chemotherapy, and no decrement either. So there's really no difference here. When we look at just the patients who had RAEB, or advanced MDS, uh, in this series, so culled out, again, there were really no differences here as well. So slightly different of opinions here on the role of chemotherapy, one study demonstrating that you can pull out the patients who are going to do poorly if you give them induction, and one saying you get absolutely no advantage uh, if you treat them. So what about hypomethylating therapy? So when these drugs came on the market, there was a great flurry uh, in the transplant world to try to get the first papers out there in the use of these agents prior to transplantation. And what we ended up with were, uh, in, a, in the course of a few months, three papers looking at 25 patients who got 24 different conditioning regimens and uh, GVHD prophylaxis regimens. So initially, we were unable to make heads or tails of the data. Luckily, the group at Moffitt went on to perform one of the larger retrospective reviews on this topic. So they examined uh, about 45 patients who had a median of four cycles of azacitidine prior to undergoing transplant. Here, again, no survival advantage was seen in the patients who were pretreated before undergoing transplantation. But of course, there is inherent bias here. The clock started at the time of transplantation, and we don't know which patients received azacitidine therapy and then did not make it to the transplant unit because they progressed, because they became too ill, et cetera, et cetera. And so again, looking at data like this does not give you the full picture of, uh, of showing that there are, in fact, differences between outcomes. So we've seen chemo versus nothing. We've seen hypomethylation versus nothing. Now we get into the bigger question of chemotherapy versus hypomethylation. And so this is a retrospective study done by Aaron Gerds, uh, who at, from the Hutch, but he's not there any longer. Um, so this uh, compares traditional azacitidine-based hypomethylating therapy to uh, Fred Hutch-style induction chemotherapy. The groups were actually imbalanced when one looks at the baseline characteristics here with a much larger proportion of patients in the induction group having more advanced MDS, so inherent bias right there. And so this curve looks like there might be some, uh, some favoring of the azacitidine over chemotherapy, but in fact, when one does proper multivariable modeling to control for differences in the baseline characteristics, one sees that in fact, there were really no differences in outcome comparing azacitidine to chemotherapy. And finally, um, the most glorious, largest biased retrospective analysis that we can look at, also comparing chemotherapy to hypomethylating therapy to what's even worse, the combination of the two agents. So just for a second, take a step back and imagine which of your patients get both hypomethylating therapy and then induction chemotherapy before heading to the transplant unit. These are clearly the worst of the worst and in no way uh, should be compared to those patients who get either hypomethylating therapy or chemotherapy. But anyway, just on a theme, it's the French, right, Guillermo? So, uh, this group included 49 patients, excuse me, 48 patients who had azacitidine alone, uh, 100 or so who had chemo alone, and then 17 very bad actors who required both therapies before getting to the transplant unit. Um, very quickly, I dismiss of the lower curve, that's the group of patients who received both 
induction and hypomethylating therapy prior to transplant, they of course did worse, as one would have predicted. But importantly, from this, ret from this retrospective uh, analysis, again, hypomethylating therapy and chemotherapy were equivalent in patients who underwent transplantation eventually. So very hard to recommend one form of therapy over the other based on all of this retrospective data. So here's what I think our field needs. A very clean, straightforward, prospective, randomized trial. So we choose our patients, we consent and enroll our patients, and we randomize them. And we randomize them before they start getting either intensive therapy or hypomethylation. And once they've completed their prescribed course, and it quite frankly doesn't matter to me because I don't know that we know which is the right hypomethylation or which is the right induction therapy, they then go on to the transplant phase. But what a clinical trial like this does is it allows us to measure outcomes from the time of randomization before hypomethylation and before intensive chemotherapy. And so you capture all the patients who are intended to undergo transplant and those who fall off early because of toxicity or progression are actually uh, incorporated in the transplant outcomes and it'll tell you which is the global better strategy, chemo followed by transplant or azacitidine followed by transplant. So this is the optimal. Sadly, this is what the trial has become. And so this is actually the schema uh, for this prospective randomized clinical trial. I cannot make heads or tails of this. I'm very concerned that when all is said and done, nobody's going to make heads or tails of this, unfortunately. But this is what we've got. So to me, the main consideration in choosing what one does prior to transplantation is the issue of the donor. And so I'll take a step back and say it takes us time to find donors and I would recommend very, very early consultation with the transplant unit whenever uh, you meet a patient who you think at some point could be a transplant candidate. Let us meet them, let us get their HLA typing and let us begin their search as early as possible. Bigger centers can get donors within four to six weeks. Smaller centers who rely on the NMDP for their searching require three plus months at times. So that's just a push to get, the, get HLA typing done early and let us start our search. So if a donor is not immediately available, most of us have this gut-wrenching obligation feeling to do something that it's just not right to sit on this MDS patient and watch them progress, watch their blast count go up. And that's generally what makes us feel we, we need to do something. We know that the median time from diagnosis to transplantation in those who get a transplant is somewhere between six and nine months, depending on whether you look at the American or the European data. So there, you do have time to do something and to impact this patient's outcome. My gut and my preference is generally hypomethylation therapy over induction chemotherapy. Um, we find that there is some element of toxicity that one gets with induction chemotherapy. There uh, probably is more patient-related mortality when one induces, um, although at big centers I'm sure that is a, a minimum. But I don't think that there is a hard and fast rule that one needs to say this, you know, everyone should get hypomethylation. Of course, clinical trials should be promoted whenever they're available. And there are instances in which we do recommend induction chemotherapy. CMML is, in fact, one of those scenarios. These patients have packed marrows. They have uh, poor engraftment characteristics because of their splenomegaly. And those are patients who we often do shunt towards induction-type chemotherapy. But the garden variety MDS patient, we generally do not. Who is it that, when we, uh, who is it that we do actually recommend induction chemotherapy for? Well, if you think that there's, if their donor is immediately available, you need to ask yourself, is it actually worth the wait to do something prior to transplant? And the two main reasons why we actually delay transplantation in favor of some pre-transplant therapy are the following. The first is if you have a patient in whom you are planning on doing a reduced intensity or a very reduced toxicity transplant. 
if these patients have high blast counts, their outcomes are very poor with transplantation. So 10, 12, or 15 percent, depending on where you work, is a general cutoff to bringing someone into the transplant unit without induction chemotherapy. But we will routinely transplant individuals with up to 10 to 12 percent blasts without any induction or without hypomethylating therapy, and it works. The second reason to consider doing something prior to transplant, in my opinion, are people who you really don't want to do a transplant on. These patients who have very poor molecular features or adverse cytogenetic features. Um, I'm talking about the patients who have p53 mutations and those who we know have a very poor outcome with transplantation. And these are people who we probably are not helping with transplantation at all. And bringing them to a clinical trial or a novel agent that targets the p53 pathway um, before attempting transplant is probably very reasonable. If you can decrease their p53 burden, change their dominant clone going into transplant, then you actually have the chance of, uh, of improving their outcomes with transplantation. So aside for, from uh, these last few features, if we have a donor immediately available, we generally do not recommend waiting to move on to transplant. With that, uh, I think I'm going to close. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions or uh, discuss other strategies. Thank you.